Can a car manufacturer excite its customer enough to say, wow? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2000. SN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. This week we're on the beach in California, just outside of Del Mar. And you know, it seems like just yesterday, although it was 1992, we were last here for the long-awaited launch of Chrysler's LH vehicles. They were then dubbed Last Hope because despite the success of the early minivan, this was a company in big trouble. Well, the rest is history, and who's going to argue that since then, Chrysler's been designing some of the prettiest cars on our highways today. Well, once again, automotive journalists from around the world have come here to California to check out what many believe is the most anticipated and the most talked about car in Chrysler's history. After all, what's, what's a reveal without some special effects? This was the scene at the 2000 North American International Experience Auto Show in Detroit as Chrysler had some fun unveiling the PT Cruiser collection. Now, the PT Cruiser has triggered lots of excitement since it was unveiled over a year ago at this same show. The front wheel drive vehicle is now in production in Toluca, Mexico. We really wanted to do something that was going to be impossible for people to categorize. The first, people, first thing we get Everybody comes up to us and say, well, what is it? You know, what, what category? Is it a car? Is it a truck? What is it? And we said, look, you're going to have to help us define, but what we were looking to do was find something that was intriguing enough for the customer that they were going to have to seek you out. It's one of those things that not only is it fulfill the difference of being unique, it's, it's differentiated in a functional way as well, so people can see that they've got room to carry their stuff and they've got room to take their belongings or to do weekend things with biking or other jaunts. So people have really responded. We want to transcend all demographics, all genders, all ages, and, and, and the way we tried to do that with the nostalgic style of the vehicle is uh, for a younger customer, for a new buyer, and, and, and the younger age groups, it's, a, it's an all-new vehicle. This architecture hasn't been on the road for ages, and it evokes that emotion, and so it's something totally new. There's nothing on it on the road right now that looks like it. At the same time, we don't violate our older demographics. Uh, this car has a very familiar feel to it because of that exact same architecture, that exact same nostalgic styling. So we actually get the best of both worlds, the best of the old school and the new school. What it means specifically to the Chrysler brand here in Canada is it really is, uh, if you will, the biggest step for us this calendar year in terms of the rollout of new product. It's going to, uh, it's a real head turner. Uh, we, we say it's a love-hate relationship with this product. The people either love it or they don't get it, they dislike it, they wouldn't come in our showrooms anyway. And we're rolling it out here in California because California is a very import focused market and we feel if we can win over California, we can win over Vancouver and Maritimes and clearly the rest of the provinces across Canada. The overall gesture of the vehicle, we slant this whole hatchback forward. It gives the vehicle direction, it gives it motion. And then we flank the rear with a lot of sheet metal. We've got this huge expanse, like a large door. That helps gives us a couple of uh, things we want to communicate. It's the safety, the overall impact of a lot of sheet metal, that this is a strong vehicle, it's secure, it's confident. At the same time, it gives us a nice canvas where we can really accent some of the features like the wing badge medallion here that's incorporated into the release latch. You've probably heard this before. There are many say, well, it's built on a neon platform. It's simply a neon with different clothing. Sure. And, and in fact, it's, that's not even the case. It's an all-new vehicle platform. 18% of the uh, components are shared between the neon and the PT. And those are mostly fasteners and knobs and switches. So the majority of the stuff is all new. It's an all brand new suspension system with a patented rear end suspension system. The interior is all new. 
and uh, there are no sheet metal compared, uh, parts that are compared between the two. Well, we didn't set out to develop it from a hot rod perspective. Uh, yes, there are some cues for the 30s and the 40s kinds of retro cues, but what we, design, what we developed is an everyday vehicle for everyday customers. Good ride and handling, very adequate performance, but outstanding versatility and functionality. In the front, we really wrap this fender along close and tighten up this part right here. We want to get this as close to the wheel as possible, again, to emphasize the wheel and tire package and wrap that fender right around. And then we shroud the bumper. We want to accent the bumper to give it that toughness. This car is more of a hybrid vehicle. It's got a lot of car qualities and truck qualities, and we wanted to capitalize on both, and that's why we accent the bumper. We're definitely going to sell a lot. We'll sell as many as we can make. Um, right now, demand is extremely high. We've, we've had over 10,000 people in Canada come forward and say they want to learn more about the PT Cruiser. Our first year, we're, we should have nine to 10,000 coming into Canada, and uh, as we go forward, production will increase. And the best consumer or buyer is a happy owner that's driving the vehicle on the streets of Canada because wherever they go, they're going to have to play the 20 questions. What is it? Who builds it? Where'd you get it? How much did it cost? How do you like it? And we have one simple uh, statement that we'd like our consumers to do is that smile and say, wow. Okay, that's, that's what it's all about. You can see a Gen Xer buying this and putting some really bad graphics on it and a big pipe out the back and slamming it down low. And I could see his father buying one or his grandfather and putting flames up the front. So they got a unique car. The street smart gorilla fighting PT Cruiser, it doesn't even know what battle it's fighting. That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, the first version was revolutionary. The second version, it went very radical. This week on Test Drive, we hopped behind the wheel of the all-new Taurus, a vehicle that's now rather formal. Power for the Taurus comes from a four-cam, 24-valve, 3.0-litre V6 that's good for 200 horsepower and 200 pounds-feet of torque, both figures being up 15 from last year. Generally, it's a smooth operator that delivers decent power across the entire range. I say generally because at certain engine speeds it develops a resonance. While not bad by any means, it's out of place in an otherwise serene package. Four-speed automatic married to this motor slips between the cogs in a seamless manner. It's also adaptive, adjusting the shift points to maintain the smoothness as the transmission ages. The Taurus wagon is suspended on McPherson struts at the front and a double wishbone design with gas shocks at the back. Given its soft demeanor, the limits show up early. That said, this is a wagon designed more for comfort than handling prowess. In the pylon test, the nose pushes out, resulting in mild but predictable understeer. Body roll is, while reasonably controlled, a constant companion. Finally, the power-assisted rack and pinion steering is nicely weighted and delivers fast turnings, at least for a wagon. Perhaps the most significant improvement to the Taurus is the addition of adjustable pedals. To set the lot up, you simply adjust the seat so it's far enough back from the steering wheel. You then bring the pedals to the right position. You've now got the perfect driving position. But more important, the relationship between you and the airbag is correct. So if it does deploy, it will help rather than hurt. Stopping power comes in the form of a four-wheel disc brake system that comes with standard anti-lock. The latter also works in reverse to add all-speed traction control. You know, it's a shame Ford didn't take some of that ingenuity and engineering and put it into the pedal feel. As it stands, it's far too wooden and takes a lot of effort to get the desired stopping distance. The area you do appreciate in the reworked Taurus is the level of quiet. Improvements in the suspension and isolation have eliminated a lot of the usual boombox effect you expect to find in a wagon. The reason I said formal off the top, well it's inside here. Everything is very formal and very classy looking. The biggest improvement however is the fact that the little tiny fiddly buttons of old that you used to find in every single Ford, well they're gone. You've now got very large user friendly buttons that can be used easily with a gloved hand. Everything else, well the ergonomics are about as good as they get. The really neat part though 
is this centre console that folds out. It gives you the perfect spot for your coffee and your cell phone, neither of which should be done while driving. The view through the rear view mirror is rather distorted and that does two things. First of all, it doesn't give you a true representation of what's happening behind you and second, it makes the car look like it's a country mile long. The second spot that wasn't very well thought through is the wiper. As it only cleans this area here, you end up with a large blind spot there and a very large one down through here. It wasn't thought through very well. The reason for the country mile look is to add the needed versatility and a very handy third seat. While Ford are busy touting the Taurus's five-star frontal crash test rating and their new personal safety system, they forgot all about rear seat headrests. And that could just prove to be the biggest pain in the neck. The personal safety system ensures that if the airbag deploys, the seat belt pretensioner pulls you back into the seat and away from the oncoming airbag. It also monitors seat belt usage, controls the speed of airbag deployment and checks the position of the driver. In spite of my criticisms, the new Ford Taurus's rework has been done very well. The really nice part about this vehicle is the fact that if you go with this extra third seat, it's the perfect alternative to a minivan. Recall announcements are a fact of life in the automobile industry, but very seldom make the headlines. But there are exceptions. First, Daimler Chrysler has recalled Prowlers in the 1999 model year because of faulty frames. One source said a subcontractor failed to heat treat some of the parts involved in the frame. Some owners of cars found defective will actually get new Prowlers. Meanwhile, Automotive News reports that the Ford Motor Company is spending at least $200 million to appease owners of about 700,000 aging cars and minivans. The problem is failure of head gaskets on a 3.8 liter V6 engine on various vehicles in the 94-95 model year, they include Tauruses, Sables, Windstars and Lincoln Continentals. In some cases, Ford is willing to buy back six-year-old vehicles and give owners $3,000 toward the purchase of another Ford vehicle. Our Midas tip of the week concerns hydraulic clutch actuation systems. If you have a late model car or light truck with a standard transmission, in all likelihood you'll have a hydraulic actuating system for that clutch system. Usually located up here under the hood, slightly to the left of the brake master cylinder. It contains a very small quantity of fluid and it's not normal for that fluid to diminish in the normal operation of the vehicle. If that level is going down consistently or to any great degree, you've got a leak in the system. Now if it goes completely empty and you lose the clutch pedal, refilling it won't always correct the situation. You usually have to go underneath the car and bleed the system down to the slave cylinder located on the transmission. Not something that you can do yourself, but you will have to do that to restore correct operation. Most important thing to remember with these systems, brake fluid is the only fluid recommended for these systems. Don't introduce any different kind of fluid into that system or you will damage all the components in the system and have to replace them. Brake fluid only from a clean, unopened container, just like the brake master cylinder. That's your Midas tip of the week. Well, obviously Chrysler is excited about their new PT Cruiser, but as I mentioned earlier, automotive journalists from around the world are here to get their first glimpse of this car in the flesh. So we asked a few about their impressions. Well, my thoughts are that uh, they've done an excellent job of packaging. Uh, the inside is so practical, yet the outside is uh, very much uh, the retro styling that uh, is so popular today amongst the manufacturers. Uh, Brian Nesbitt, who designed the car, had mentioned to me that they were trying to uh, make a car that was very American. And so they've used styling cues, I believe, from things like 37 Chevys, 37 Fords. And you can see that in things like the taillights, even though they're an odd shape, a more modern shape, uh, when you put the brakes on, there's a round brake light. Uh, you have the dash, which looks like two pieces of metal on both sides. But the performance uh, that we saw today in this first drive uh, was, I thought, more than adequate, especially with the five-speed transmission. 
and the base car especially really impressed me. For a 23.2, five-speed stick, uh, pretty good shifter, enough power, mm, could use a little bit more torque in the low end, but it's fine up high. It's a fun car that's useful. It's really a little minivan. One thing they're going to want to do, I think, with this vehicle on the dealer side, when they come to retail it, they're going to want to make sure that they have one person in the dealership who assists in deliveries. The reason I say that, that anybody who leases or purchases one of these things, there are so many features inside this vehicle, and I don't know one retail salesperson on the face of the earth that'll have the time or the memory to go through everything on the vehicle. It really is amazing. It's, uh, it's good value, and something uh, in this vehicle that I noticed right away when we drove it, transfer of road noise is almost nil. It is the quietest new product in this price bracket that this company has ever built. So I think they're going to win it. You know, they call the PT Cruiser a multi-purpose vehicle, and for good reason. Both back seats fold down. They actually come out of the vehicle for extra room. And this little shelf is very handy, but the designers have taken it a few steps further. You can also move it down to the middle level, the bottom level, and if you've got some dirty things, just flip it over. There's no carpet to get filthy. But one of my favorite positions is the tailgate position. You want to stop, have a little picnic, put it there, bring the leg down, and you're all set to go. And by the way, check out all this headroom. And you know, I'm six feet four in my dreams. All right, let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Bill? Well, Brad, most Chrysler vehicles built since the mid-90s really appeal to me styling-wise. The Ram pickup, the Dakota, and I love the look of the Grand Cherokee. But that PT Cruiser, not my cup of tea, and that's putting it mildly. Anyhow, uh, this week we've got an email to answer from a viewer in Kingston, Ontario, Bill Papadakis. He's got a, a Honda Odyssey van by the sound of it. He mentions a 3.5 liter Honda VTEC engine and a van, so it must be a late model Odyssey. The situation is that uh, he said he recently had the oil and filter changed and shortly thereafter lost the majority of the engine oil down to the point that the oil light came on. Now he went to the dealership, got the thing to the dealership, I guess, and they uh, assessed the damage on it, replaced the oil filter, I guess, and assumed that there was no engine damage. What he's asking is, how long can I drive a car without it seizing, without any oil? And uh, my van seems fine, but how do I know if there was any en engine damage done? Well, to be quite honest with you, Bill, short of tearing the engine down for a visual inspection and mic micrometer inspection on many of those components, you really won't know. But I think your dealer probably read between the lines and figured out that there was a small quantity of oil still in the engine, enough for the engine to survive, and you didn't mention in your letter any awful sounds before, during, or after this event. Those sounds are the, the knocking or you know, clashing sounds of metal on metal when an engine runs completely out of oil. If you didn't have those sounds, in all likelihood you had just enough oil in there for that thing to survive. Now it's been my experience that with overhead cam engines like the ones that Honda uses, if you have a complete loss of oil pressure for even a short period of time, the first thing that happens is one or both of the camshafts seize up and that breaks the timing belt and the engine stops just like that. That's the typical scenario with an overhead cam engine that runs out of oil. Now because that didn't ha happen on your engine, I'm going to assume that you probably didn't have any damage, but to be quite honest with you, short of a complete teardown, which I'm sure that nobody really wants to go through on this vehicle, you won't know for sure. Keep your fingers crossed, I think you probably got lucky in this case. Now just to familiarize the rest of our viewers, there's an oil filter from a different kind of engine and the situation that Bill had on his van was this o-ring seal around the perimeter of the oil filter got stuck to the engine block and when they took the previous oil filter off to replace it this o-ring remained on the engine they installed another oil filter over top of that o-ring and the old o-ring blew out of there it's absolutely inevitable anybody that's done a lot of oil changes has probably had this happen to them one or more times in their career so make sure that when you're doing an oil change, if you do it yourself or guys in the service uh, department, make sure that you look for that old O-ring when you take off an oil filter and make sure it's still on the old oil filter when it comes off. If you don't see it there, in all likelihood it's stuck to that engine. You put the new one on on top, you're in big trouble. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. If you're big into cars, check out MotoringTV.com and while you're at it, download a copy of Autopilot. Autopilot software searches out the matches to your automotive interest and makes the most of your online time.
Okay, so the PT Cruiser is a really cool looking car. Looks like a 1940 Willys panel truck, but never mind. Everybody loves this thing because it's a car, it's a truck, it's a minivan, it's a sport utility vehicle. But I'll tell you why everybody loves this car. It's pretty simple. This is a hatchback. I mean, the hatchback's the most intelligent form of car ever designed. It's compact, doesn't take up a lot of room on the road, but because it's got lots of room, it's got this thing you can stand under, you don't get r rained on, the seats fold, there's lots of room for your stuff. So why don't we have more hatchbacks? Well, it's simple. Now, don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are Americans. I wouldn't even mind if my sister married one, but they won't buy hatchbacks. I don't know why, it's some kind of downscale image, they think hatchbacks are cheap or something, I don't know. But think about it, why do they like sport utility vehicles? Basically, SUVs are hatchbacks. They make so much sense. But down here in the States, you can't throw a Volkswagen Golf off buildings on a people. They won't buy them. You think of something like that Corolla liftback a few years ago? Great car, Americans didn't want any part of it. And let's not forget, my American Motors Hornet hatchback. So the most important aspect of this car, why it's gonna be so significant to the market? Finally, here's a hatchback that even an American can love. I'm Jim Kinsey. Well, Jimmy is right. The Americans will buy the PT Cruiser. So will the Canadians, and the Europeans won't be far behind. And as the young designer Brian mentioned earlier, this is a car that should appeal to both young and old. Well, us old guys are fond of talking about how good music and automobiles were in the good old days. My opinion has not changed about music, but you know, I don't want this to sound like a commercial, but thanks to companies like Chrysler, the young people today will get a chance to drive cars that look cool, are fun to drive, and come with modern technology. And it doesn't get any better than that. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. What we're trying to do with the RX Evolve is really embody the spirit of Mazda into a vehicle and deliver a rejuvenation or the end point of the brand. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.